Hey everybody, welcome back to the quest for the bestest. We are here once again to discover what the very best best picture winner of all time is this week. We've got Abram. He's back. He's back hey. from his debut. He's back from his vacation. He's chilling out with I us. Know. And you might notice a little unfamiliar pipsqueak of a voice, a little a little new face up in the corner there. It's Tucker and I's good friend from high school, Gabe. He watched the movie uh, with Tucker last night and is here to discuss what his thoughts of the of the last emperor were and um we're gonna we're gonna get right going i mean we just we just go go right into it gabe say hello to the well, say hello I'm to here. the fine folks tucker's here too but hey, he's always what's here. Up? It's, it's gabe um i'm excited i'm kind of excited to talk about this movie but you know we have our chores we got to do our little chore before we dive in we got to talk yeah. about where we ranked last week's film. Last week was West Side Story, the musical from 1961. And now Tucker and I are the only two that were actually there to talk about it. We mm -hmm. had varying, very differing opinions. Um, Tucker didn't like it very much. He put it at number 13. I thought it was at number six. And so the movie averaged out to be number 10, which is where Tanner thought it should go as well. So right now, the middle of the list goes Godfather Part 2 at number 8, Platoon at number 9, West Side Story at number 10, French Connection at number 11, and Ordinary People at number 12. So this week, we're talking about an entirely different movie. It's The Last Emperor, directed by Bernardo Bertolucci from 1987. It's the story of Pu Yi, the last Chinese emperor to be um, crowned in China before the events of the 20th century transformed um, the nation into a very different place and about his entire life. And the movie is about as long sure. as an entire life. So yeah, yes, let's, it is. let's dive right in. We were a little wrong last week. We thought it was four hours. It's actually only like three. Yeah, I would like to blame Dr. Jonathan Letterboxd for giving me an incorrect fucking number on the length of this film. And I have no idea how that happened because I've never seen that happen on Letterboxd before. I was going to say I was strapping down for like a Lord of the Rings type movie and it was two hours 40, which is not anything like horrible. It's like, yeah. that's like piss change compared to Lawrence of Arabia, you know? I know, I got primed for this fucking, you know, slow and drawn out movie, but that's not what I got in the end, or is it? How did you guys feel about this movie? I'm so excited to talk about this. I fell asleep for the last 15 minutes of the movie. I've since gone back and finish, finished it, but this was not quite the quest return I was hoping for. I don't know how you guys feel, because we really haven't talked about this one. Gabe, since you're our like, guest, start us off. Give, give us, your, yeah, give us the say, lowdown. Can I start this off yeah. talking about how... This is like a long, I was ready for a long, slow movie, and the very start of the movie, each scene is not that long, it's really colorful, it's really interesting, and especially at the very beginning, it like caught me, and it, I never lost it, like, uh, it, until at the end when I agreed with Abram, it really slowed down, but for the most part, it was really, really engaging, and I didn't feel super long to me. Huh, that's very yeah. interesting. Tucker, you, you watched it with Gabe in person, what were your thoughts on it after seeing? Yeah, we, I'm, gonna say, I'm in the same boat. Um, I we, we sort of talked about it as we, as we were watching it, and as I realized this is a two hour forty five minute movie. I'm not a particularly long movie guy, as it's known to be. Um, but I was realizing that I'm very engaged for the first two thirds, or you know, a little bit more than that of the movie, three fourths maybe, um, because the scenes are very quick, as Gabe said. The visuals are incredibly engaging. You're you're sort of transferred to this almost otherworldly place where all these really strange things happen that are completely different from anything we've ever experienced in our fucking white boy American lives. Um, and I was, I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, the last act of the movie, I think is such a complete tonal shift that it just, it just lost me and it killed a lot of the impact. Huh? Yeah, I would, I, um, I actually felt this movie was very slow. I felt this, it seemed to me like it lasted a lot longer than the two hour and 45 minute runtime, which as a, as you know, Tucker is the average short movie um, fan and I'm the average long movie enjoyer of the group. Um, I didn't really care. I like, I like being able to sit there and just let the movies play on and just like get to experience it all for a long time. But I felt like it really did last a long time. Um, that said, I was still engaged and gripped by what was happening just by the sheer foreignness of it. Just like all these, you know, Create the, the the women with the octagonal hairdos and like the the little boy who's the emperor and they sniff his poop and like you know all this stuff where I just kind of watch and I'm like D -d -d like that's like real like what like exactly, that's in yeah. like huh you know and that was really interesting and then you know as I got to the end and I started thinking about the film some more instead of just a, you know watching it um I, it's it's kind of started to dawn on me about like 
what what it was trying to say. And I think that there's some interesting thoughts in the film that it it asks quest it poses some cool questions that are fun to discuss, but I don't think it answers much. Yeah, Abram, thoughts? I think well, so aesthetically, I think the film is is incredible, especially early on. The, the way the film is visually and, and the, the audio and everything, the experience of watching it is really something special. But have you boys been to the Met or any other big museum, gallery, something like that? Yes, I have. I've sure. been to the I, Met. I, I felt like I was back at the Met where it's really engaging visually, but you start, you start to get lost a little bit and you don't want to be there as long as you have to be. And I found that for as compelling as, as the plot is coming in as, as someone with very little knowledge about Chinese history... I found that the general slow paced ness of the film kind of turned me off. So for as compelled as I was by the visuals and by the movement of the plot as a whole, I don't know. It just didn't really connect with me in any real resonant way. That's interesting. So I watched this with my parents and my dad said the similar thing. He said that he really did not get drawn in by the film at all, which I kind of disagree with just in other elements. He was like, I, he didn't find the characters very in what engaging or, or something something along those lines i don't want to put words into his mouth but he he you know was less i don't know he said he compared it to argo he's like argo like grips me and like makes me like i can't peel away but he felt like he could maybe peel away from it which was a different experience than i had and what sounds like you two gabe and tucker had but interesting that that could happen both in similar viewings gabe i actually kind of agree with kurt a little bit there like uh the part of the film that really drew me in was the aesthetic the culture the the um the visuals all the foreignness of it but any individual character i wasn't all that engaged with especially young puyi i loved but the adult puyi especially when he's in the prison is really I, I, it's such a shift from what he is in the earlier parts of the film that he kind of really lost me and none of the other characters are developed enough for me to care very much at all yeah, so I actually am of, of two minds of the long storytelling, the changes, you know, watching essentially an entire, a guy's entire life. Um, I, I think that it's great that we're able to see so much of an individual's life and watch those changes as it happens and, and see him over the course of many years at different ages and different experiences that end up shaping who he is. And of course, you get the surrounding history of the conflicts going on outside of the walls of the um, Forbidden City. Uh, sort of being touched on, but not really, because he is stuck inside. He doesn't really know what's going on. All of that is such a fascinating conceit for a film that I was instantly engaged by it. However, I think, and this is one of my main issues with long form, you know, over the decade storytelling in general. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of Boyhood. There's a lot of movies that are that are told like this format that I just think loses some impact because when you do such gigantic time skips you lose a lot of connection to that character because they become so different in the course of a cut. Um, and, and so I think that while it was interesting to see so many changes in one individual's life, the fact that it was jumping around so much, I mean, sort of just showing, showing you know, vignettes from, from this guy's life, um, you didn't really get a full character arc because it was, it was chopping around so, so frequently. I think it's very interesting you bring up the idea of the vignette. And to me, that's what the film really was, was this large collection of vignettes of this guy's life, which when I thought about like why each individual one was shown, it felt it fit less into the idea of a large plot structure and as, as like an arc or something as just like a downfall. I mean, he goes from having no power as a kid to having no power as an adult. It's just like his path as an adult as a through his entire life, just not ever being in control. And yet he is you know, starts out as the most powerful man and becomes a, a nothing man, but he never has any control. And these ideas and these themes and like the like the being brought the way he was brought up as a kid. And you can I feel like I can see that reflected in how he acts later in his life is very interesting and works for the long form storytelling. But I agree that there are times when it cuts and he changes and it takes me. He does some stuff and it make it, it takes me too long to catch up to him as to why he did that. Like, did, yeah. so like, you know, he he when he's being manipulated by the Japanese in the latter half of the movie. And it's, it's a little bit harder to get exactly what's going on maybe because I'm not quite being shown enough and I have to, I really have to struggle yeah. to put together the pieces. And as far as like interestingness, maybe that like we've, we've been hinting at, you know, I do agree that the last couple, I don't know, the last 30 minutes, last 25 minutes are the weakest, which is a shame, but 
I mean, I really enjoyed the uh, the cinematography and the lighting and the set design. It was just like you said. It was. It's like. It's it's like a. F- it's like a fantasy movie. It's like a fantasy movie, but you're like, this is also real life. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's otherworldly. It's on another level. Continue. Sorry. Continue. Sorry. Seriously. And the the no, I was just going to say that and the the painful measures to be historically accurate in as many different places as they possibly could over and over again throughout the movie was an impressive body of work, honestly. Yeah, I, I mean, think that's imagine... really where the film. Sorry. Well, I think that's where the film really succeeds. It's on this sort of technical intellectual level that The Last Emperor really worked for me. Uh, but I'm someone who really likes the feel of a film. And there's certain sequences that I really felt. I, I, clearly, the one that stands out to me is when he tells the guy to drink the green ink. And the way that the tone shifts is so incredible. But I found that sequences like that were fewer and further between than I had hoped for. So these more emotional beats are what I connect to more as a viewer and what I felt I got less of. And in its place was this more uh, intellectual, thematic, and, and historical account with this lavish production. But I just don't know how that really hits for me in terms of the more subjective lens I view film through. I felt like emotionally, it, the film was very tragic to me. It was a very, it was a very difficult and very heart wrenching story to watch. This boy, who's you know Peter O'Toole's character, Peter O'Toole, I think he's great in this movie. I really love him as Johnston, um, and his yeah. interactions with Puyi as he grows up are are delightful to watch. Um, One of the highlights of the movie, for sure. I mean, I you you can't you can't argue that I'm not a Peter O'Toole fan, so. Um, but just the way, there's how tragic he is. He's the loneliest boy in China. He's, you know, a prisoner in his own fortress. And the, all those bits connected to me in this, like, very detached way. It, it wasn't like a total, like, oh, I feel how this character is. But it's like, oh, I see how bad, and I, just like how messed up he has to be through the way he was raised. And then uh, my my feeling about it is like later on we get to see his messed up edness f- from being raised like that play out in his life and cause him problems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even think, in the like one of the first scenes in the film when he's slitting his own wrists in the prison bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that um, the end of the movie sort of does such a tonal shift. And the reason I think it doesn't work for me, as you were alluded to, Timo, is it changes from a lot of show don't tell to tell don't show. And, and it's a lot of people talking about things that were happening in the rest of the world and describing scenarios that you're not exactly seeing. And, and, and political Just to clarify, only halfway. You're, you're referring to the parts in the Manchu Guo um, areas where sure, yes. that, so like that whole bit where he becomes the new emperor and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. That was all just very confusing to me because I, 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 was, I was trying my damnedest to pay really good attention, but I felt like there was such a, a shift there and a jump that they were just having to explain to me, you know, catch me up on what had happened over the last few years. Oh, oh, you know, new political intrigue, wars between countries, th- things were happening, new leaders coming to power, people are invading and there's conflicts and you don't see any of that. You're just getting people talking about it. And I think that that takes away from a lot of the power because the first part, the first majority of the movie, the first two thirds, you know, half, whatever, is is such an interesting conceit of this this child who, as you said, is, is the loneliest boy in China, but he's also a kid who has power going to his head because, of course, he does. I mean, people are telling him he's the yeah. son of God and, like, he's going to live for 10,000 years. Like, there, there's a lot of that strange moments that you get to connect to because you're just, it's so wild, but then it's it's stripped back. And, and, and I know that's, you know, historically accurate and it, it makes for a, a tonal shift that I think they were trying to be super compelling, but I just don't think it fits so well together but on the whole i think this movie is so strong in the things that it's strong with like we were saying the set design and and just the production value in general this is one of the most batshit insane like how the production managers i can't even imagine so did you did did you look did you look in the credits they actually filmed this movie inside the forbidden city in the 80s I didn't know that. This no. was one of the first times they let cameras into the Forbidden City to film it. And so not only did they gather new, you know, gather measurements and gather pictures and whatnot, but they actually filmed some scenes in Beijing, which, you know, I mean, the, so there's a, I think there is a little bit of a reason why the movie is not uh, is not super hard on the um, on the Maoists at the end um they had to sure. appease you know they had to get if they were going to make the film as accurate as possible they had to get in there and you know show whatnot but on the whole 
I mean, you're right about that production design. Batshit is the only way to describe it. It's insane. Yes. <laughs> there are so it, many... It's hard on anyone. Sorry, keep going, Timo. Um, there are so many shots that just, like, blow me away. And, like, the way... I don't know. To me, the whole Forbidden City looked kind of decrepit. It looked like it was kind of falling apart. Um, yeah. And and I didn't really dawn on me until, until, like, some of that had been brought out through the character action. But then I was, like, I looked around and I'm like, wait a second. It's This place is, like, not that nice looking like there's chipped paint and grass coming through the cracks and like whatnot and then it was like i felt like that mirrored the characters very well and it was just like a, a cool little moment for me you know little old me watching the movie like oh the production design you know is mirroring the character's feelings seriously i agree with that abram do you, you, I you got some say, thoughts i i think that the idea of the tonal shift is interesting but it also i think there's an aesthetic shift that i didn't quite connect me in the Manchu quote sections also because part of uh, what was jarring but what I really came to love about the first part of the film is when you're going between uh, the prison and back to the emperor's youth there's this juxtaposition in terms of these these lavish shots with everybody in the and palace I actually, right and I then, just want to interject it is shot differently yeah. like the, the color processing the film stock I think is different between the sections and it highlights that shift even more yeah, because then you go back to the prison and everyone's dressed identically and it's one color and that's so powerful. But then I think that as you as you uh, grew up with the emperor a little bit, you lost the aesthetic as well as the tone. And I think that that's why the the, the sleepiness started to set in a little bit as I, as I got deeper into the film. Uh, but I think just from from a from a more fundamental perspective and from a thematic perspective, that's what started to lose me, too. So I think there's there is a point there where I just don't think that it's as strong in terms of again in terms of feel and in terms of theme and i think that's where i really was lost it's hard i mean oh gabe go ahead go ahead i think one of the main ways that this film loses people is you realize that because and it's 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 it's, his, it's painful historical accuracy you realize that there's not really a whole lot of an arc it's a really shallow one where he goes from powerless because he's a child to powerless because he's not the true emperor outside of the city walls to powerless because he's kicked out of China, to powerless because he's not the real emperor of Manchu Kuo, to powerless because he's in the prison, to powerless because he's a communist citizen. He doesn't really change in a meaningful way except for his perspective on it at the very, very end, and it's not even hammered home, that, but he, that he really kind of accepts his role as a communist citizen in China. But he's, that's really not even highlighted, so you really don't get a whole lot out of change out of the film other than setting. Like, like, um, for his power dynamic, anyway. I think beyond that, also, uh, it the film also shows not only lack of change, but perhaps the shallowness of of a personal audience's member inability to understand uh, Chinese history. And I really think that this is a film that you need that background on to really get more out of. So again, I think that's part of why I recognize the merit, but don't really feel the art as much because I'm kind of like, I mean, I know what happened ish with, with the rise of communism but i don't know if i'm familiar enough for the speed at which they're giving exposition to to actually hit me and for me to stay yeah. at pace mm -hmm. there there is a lot that's why i did connect to it i mean when when the manchu guo stuff starts happening and there's like you have the japanese and then you have chen kai-shek and then you have mao and you have all these different characters that you don't see that are doing stuff that are that is directly important to the plot and to the characters that you care about it becomes a little bit more difficult to like get what's going on which we've we've hammered home but is 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 different is very different from the beginning yeah actually i've got a couple other things that we, we uh, abram kind of brought up the intercutting between the two timelines and gabe and i had a lot of discussion about that as it was happening because i think that is a really strong part of the movie, watching his interrogation, juxtaposing that with him as a child, and using those future quote unquote scenes to to transition between the different time periods. I think that worked really well and it sort of tied together the whole narrative of like this is his life and he's sort of recapping it and you know, it's all thematically similar and it ties together. And I thought that was really cool. Unfortunately when you stop having that intercutting and it's all the current timeline, um that I, I think that's another reason why the last half is so different from, from the, the first sections of it, Gabe. Which, and if I might, usually when the two different timelines in a movie like this kind of stop intercutting and you're at, in the present, usually that's at a massive climax. And it's really kind of after the climax that it happens in this movie. It's kind of after everything happens and he's 
just a regular citizen. And I mean, is there a climax in this movie? There kind of isn't. And if so, yeah. it, it's not a massive pop, you know? It, it, it might be the scene where he's on the plane and they're rushing him there and his wife won't speak to him and it, they're captured by the Russian soldiers. But even that is not, it's not like a, it's not a classic climax. It's not a, like a super punch you in the face. Like this is the yeah. greatest point of action in the film. I, w- I mean, you could you could make the argument that the film doesn't use typical Hollywood structuring in terms of plot and and you know development, yeah. which is why that happens. And maybe maybe because of the, the the theme and the um and the story material, it works sort of. I think in that I don't know you, how do you how do you tell the dude's life story without vastly changing aspects to make it fit a three act or a rise and fall structure? Yeah, sure. Um. Just something to note, I think. I don't really know how what what that impacts for me, I guess. Right. I think that comes back to the painful historical accurate not painful, like like really profoundly well done historical accuracy. They can't yeah. it's so much to the point where it's almost to their detriment in some points. Like they can't perfectly fit it into the three act rise and fall, et cetera. But honestly, a part of the sorry to just keep rambling, the I don't normally like movies that shift between time like this, like the time skipping and and the going back and forth. I usually that's usually a filmmaking technique that just doesn't resonate with me. But in this movie, I actually really liked it, like Tucker was saying, because it gives you an anchor in the future where he's in prison. The interrogation is really strong, and then going back to the imperial China um, and the colors and the life story part, and it it gives it gave me like a good anchoring point and a good. Um, I don't know, feel of the film. I, I really enjoyed the way they did it, and I normally don't. As a plot device, it works very well. As as a way to, because you have to fictionalize somewhere, and to, and I mean, I mean, maybe even that really did happen, but to use that and the ordering of it, and the and the way it is told, that specific method, I think works. I've got the awards pulled up. If you want to look at, uh, if we want to talk about what it won that year, stealing my job. Well, I yeah, SMH. I don't know. So here's the deal: it it won every single thing it was nominated for at the Academy this year. It at it yeah. uh, it got it swept basically. It won nine awards. Um, so it was nominated for best picture. It was nominated for best director. It was nominated for best art direction, best cinematography, best costume design, best film editing, best original score, which has got some David Byrne in there of the old Talking Heads. I could tell a little, there was a couple little bits of that. That was fun to see in the credits and see it at the beginning and be like, oh shit, David Burns in this. All right, let's listen for some cool David Byrne music. Um, best sound. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. And then best screenplay based on material from another medium, which is adapted screenplay if you couldn't figure that one out. So those are the heavy hitting categories of the Oscars. Those are the nine most important, I would, uh, I would argue. Yeah. And it won them all. And I'm gonna I think say the score is worth n- noting just really quickly because that I really usually I'm not one to notice a score particularly closely unless it's really important to a film. And here I liked how it how it kept its distance, but every time there was a track, it really compelled me. Added a lot, so I just want to note that as someone again who usually doesn't. But that certainly, if I had been alive, what forty years ago when this was being nominated, and I was in the Oscars Academy, I would have voted for it. So I am. Um... I want to note about the cultural sensitivity, I think, of the score. It's the um it's not super I mean, it sounds like traditional Chinese music in in moments, but to me, as an outsider, as someone who is not very knowledgeable, it didn't seem like overly stereotypical and overly trying to play up its Chineseness in the score. I mean, it could help that it it has, you know, it was composed by two, you know, Ryuchi Sakamoto and Kong Su were our two Asian artists. David Byrne is a very smart and intellectual person who I have confidence that he wouldn't just go and rip, you know, do do the old cultural appropriation on a on a score. So that that felt good to me, which makes me think about, you know, the rest of the movie. There are a couple white actors here and there, but they play white characters and the rest yeah. of them are not, which, hey, that's what you should do. You did the bare minimum. Congrats. Yeah. I mean, th- this movie is is one of the best I've seen in terms of respecting another culture. Like, it does show some things that to us are just like, what? why would they do that? Like, like because w- it's so it's so different from our, the culture we grew up in. But I don't think any at any point it's, it's played for laughs. I don't think it's ever played for, oh, look how weird this is. It's just showing things that, that are 
culturally important and, and accurate and are parts of, of Puyi's life. I mean, this is not only Chinese culture, but this is Chinese culture of the highest regard of the emperor who is trapped inside of a city where everything is governed by the ancient laws and like there's so many layers here that are that are what contributes to as i said at the beginning otherworldly feel of everything um and i i think that it's really respectful and all that so i'm I'm glad that this is not like you know giving me any weird vibes like this was very off off the ground just respectful through everything and i think it did a great job with that i noted to my parents that it seemed like it took any uh a uh, um objective view to things it wasn't really trying to paint anything in a super harsh or super positive light it seemed yeah. to it seemed to be factual i mean when we were talking about the japanese in the film i mean it painted them pretty bad but you got to remember um they were pretty bad so I was actually really surprised that in the 80s, when I thought that America had a very good relationship with Japan, that they really went so hardball on the and historically accurate way that Imperial Japan treated Manchuria and China. So here's here's my question. This movie was made by Bertolucci. He's an Italian. If you watch through the credits, there's a huge amount of Italian names in the credits. Do you guys know if this film like was made in America? I could find out. Because ah. I own the Criterion Blu-ray edition of wow. The Last Emperor, so, which so, has seven documentaries about the making of this <laughs> fucking movie on it, plus interviews. I could watch... No, I haven't, I haven't seen any of it. But uh, I could learn so much about this movie. It's ridiculous. I think there is a ton of, ton of it to learn. Which, it just makes me wonder about how the Academy's choosing process... You know, the Academy's usually stupid about picking foreign films for best picture um yeah. or for picking films made by foreign entities i mean there's some drama going on this year right about a movie that's not really in english yep. but it and so it's getting kicked out of the best picture nominations and it's like come come on guys yeah. and now i mean speaking of that i just looked up because it won so many things i was curious i looked up all the nominations for best picture in 1988 the last emperor obviously moonstruck Fatal Attraction, mm. Broadcast News, and Hope and Glory were all the nominees. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, Moonstruck's the only other one I've even heard of. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, I've heard of that too, yeah. Truthfully, I hadn't really heard of this film before we got we got to uh, roll it and watch it, so. Yeah, same here. I had actually only heard of it because my mom really likes this film because she had saw it in the 80s. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I think I think... We've had some good discussion. We should have some closing thoughts, but our voting members, sorry, Gabe, your vote only sort of doesn't count, as I like to say. You get to influence us. I'm, I'm going to want you to give us the number placement before I reveal where the rest of our aggregate comes from. So if you will, use your voting devices to uh, send me your numbers, fellas. Um, while we get some some closing thoughts, the I don't know. I, I, I did enjoy the movie. I like I like a slower film, right? So... Yeah, as we know. I described it as my parents as a painting. It was like lipping up a painting, which is why your Met expression, your Abram, your your Met analogy kind of actually fits kind of well. I maybe have a different opinion on what it's like to visit the Met. Um, I really like to go and, and I don't know, this is hoity-toity pretentious ass bullshit, but whatever. <laughs> I'm going to continue with it because I think it's worthwhile. Um, and it's like, you know, go and just like, absorb and then and then start to think and then you know ponder about what 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 the what the art and the film present to me in terms of you know thematic material and questions that it asks but doesn't answer because while i think some films try to answer their own questions this one really doesn't and i mean i don't know what do you think is that a good or a bad thing i mean i think i think you you say something that i think also contributes to part of my disconnect from this film is the fact that it brings up so many things that it doesn't answer. There's even a lot of things in the movie that are just basic plot points that I, I don't feel were properly explained enough and, and contribute to be, while well, I, I have so much respect for so many aspects of it, it knocks it down overall for me. Um, who the hell was that pilot girl? Do you guys know? Like, what she just showed up. She was, was my least was favorite character up? by was, a long shot. Does anyone she's know? She's a spy. Yeah, she's yeah, a spy. What else more do you need to know? Uh, it's like it's just like and a, she's the emperor's cousin thing. yeah there, there's so many weird things that i was just like strange about it and also something gabe and i noticed is they actually kind of passed over one of the well i mean, in my opinion would have been one of the most important 
scenes of the film. I'm really glad you remembered to bring this up. Yeah, which is the marriage. They just totally passed over that. I mean, they, they skipped from the idea of he's getting married or choosing the, the partner um, to uh, their consummation of, of the marriage. It's like, well, that's a scene. That, that would have been a huge scene with emotional impact and lots of set design. Like, why, why would that be skipped? Why For is that movie, of all things? So obsessed with the grandeur and the amazing imagery of traditional Chinese dress, like ritual and and everything like that. I am actually shocked that they Tucker, I need your vote. filming the wedding scene. I DM'd it to you. Oh, well, you got to DM it to me on the, the mobile device. Oh, well, that's not what I heard. So the votes are the votes are the votes are incoming. Gabe, okay, it's in. We're still counting Nevada's votes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna need a recount on this one. We might even get a, right. we might get an even number here. We got an even number. So, Gabe, where do you place it? Lobby us for your position, and then I will reveal. Well, he where doesn't have the list. Oh man, I do not have. I've not seen most of the movies on here. I liked it. I'm just gonna say that I liked it. I really. Um, I'm a very novice moviegoer. I'm not a film or journalism or anything like that major. I just <laughs> like movies and I watch movies, and I. Didn't think I was going to like this movie honestly that much, and I really did. It it was definitely like a solid like four out of five for me. Well, there you go. So our average so fourth. So fourth. <laughs> out of fifteen. Well, our average ends up the movie at the twelfth place. We had one vote from Abram at number fourteen, one vote from Tucker at number twelve, and one vote from me at number ten. Okay. Wow. Yes, so that does. That. That is, it literally exactly gives 12, a, yeah. gives us an actual twelfth place. So, what do you what do you think about that, Abram? You had it at the lowest. Um, you maybe haven't had a whole lot of chance to speak your mind. So, clarify what's what's the reasoning behind this placement? I think it's kind of boring, and, and that's and that's kind of my, my thesis about the movie is is just not something that particularly compels me. I didn't come into it really with uh, too much of an expectation, but it. Outside of the aesthetics, it just didn't do a whole lot for me. I do like a film that's going to ask questions and not answer them. I like a longer film, but just the the more grounded, historical, straight laced element of the film just doesn't connect with me. Let's return to my to my Met analogy because I came up with it in the shower and I was proud of it, and, and Timo <laughs> likes it, so let's just fucking bring it home. I can look at a nice painting and appreciate it, but that's not what resonates with me as a viewer. And, I, and it really comes down to resonance. And the number of scenes where I felt something beyond, hey, here's a story about Chinese history that I find interesting, but not necessarily evocative. The number of scenes where I felt something more than that were very few. And while I can recognize the, the, the production value and why, while I can recognize just the, the intrigue of the situation that the emperor is placed in, it, it felt to me like I was reading a really well illustrated chapter of a history book. And that's just not what I'm looking for. And, sure. and in terms of the way that we've seen so many films that have these interesting plots and take me to different worlds, while this one does, the, the lens that it takes me there through just is not what I find compelling. I mean, there's a reason that the highest vote was at number ten. I think that this film is is good, is very enjoyable, but it it does it has it is lacking in certain elements to really punch it up to that best picture, the best best picture thing. Gabe, you wanna you wanna say one thing? Um, I'm happy. I'm happy with the twelfth placement. Are you too happy with the twelfth placement? Yeah, it's solid. Okay, well, it's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> I just wanted to agree with Abram in that I definitely felt like, and I think the reason for this is the ending of the book or the 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 visual book, the visual novel that we've been given. <laughs> That's something different there. Mo the moving image, the motion, the moving picture. image. Yeah, sure. to make myself sound like I didn't just screw up the word movie. Um, <laughs> I really felt like this movie could have been good throughout it, and it could have been a lot like a lot better on its total uh the total feeling that you have about it if the ending wasn't so history book he just kind of becomes someone in the crowd and then dies i guess you know it's there's no real satisfaction that you get from it you're just like oh okay this happened it's just history it felt very oscar movie to me and that's a sort of trope that People talk about Oscar bait and they talk about the drama and, and, and the great film. And this to me felt like that. And I and I that for me, I just feel a disconnect 
And I, I just wanted a little bit more imagination, which I was never going to get, which is why I, I hold like my objective opinion of the film pretty separately from my subjective opinion of the film. But as one of the four arbiters of the, the best, best the arbiter, picture, you arbiters know, of truth, the arbiters yeah. of truth. I got to bring that subjective lens a little bit more into focus. And I just I don't know. I would have rather watched a lot of things above it, considering I put it at number 14. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's time. This is a great discussion. Very happy. You know what? I want to look at a little graph. We got to head to the backside for this one. We got to go to the backside of the backlog banner best of the best picture ranking list. It's let's turn it around and let's look at it. Here it comes. Whoa, whoa. And it ends up at number 12th place on our list of the best of the best pictures. Yeah, that's right. You're listening to the quest for the bestest. If you didn't know now, now the moment you've all been waiting for every week we come around around you know when we record it or in the evening it's the evening right now i look forward to this every week getting to click that little button on that little little spin wheel let's um let's pull it up all right all right you ready all right all right and since there's no tanner we uh we get no rhyme this week yeah no good finally okay i hope we get blade runner um yeah me too i hope we get something like that (laughs) it's unlikely the wheel just what? pops off and shoots to another place. So, we got a number. It's the number 38. Look at that. Well, who would have thought about that number? I have... What What movie is that, Tucker? Would you like to share with us what movie number 38 <laughs> is? I would like to share this, because this is a movie I am fucking fascinated by, because I know nothing about it, other than the fact that it is rated X. We are watching the 1969... Best Picture winner, directed by John Schlesinger, starring John Voigt and Dustin Hoffman, Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy. This is an X-rated movie. Have you ever seen an X-rated movie? I have never. No, exactly. Exactly. I'm I'm ready. I gotta look this up. Midnight Cowboy. Okay, I'm I'm pretty sure. Hold on. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's true. That's... Well, there we go. That's something... It's, the the letterbox poster is really cool for it. So this movie is directed by John Schlesinger. It's John Voigt, Dustin Hoffman, um, M. Emmett Walsh. You know, you know all these good guys. It's not quite a '70s movie, and it's not quite an '80s movie. It's from 1969. So we we did th- sure. next week this week we escaped the grasp of the '70s and '80s, which is a, tough, a difficult thing for us to do. Gabe is now, showing us yeah, the that it's everywhere. Now, everywhere now here's the thing: where I what I just found out is that it was released at rated X, but the MPAA changed their, like their, they expanded the R rating to include what they initially thought of as rated X. So it got re, re uh, you know, categorized as a rated R movie. So it was a rated X movie when it came out, though. Okay, well, is it yeah. probably a little intense for people in like the late 60s are less so now? Sure, yeah. Yeah, we will, I mean, we will see. lost their shit at Frankenstein and Dracula. <laughs> Will that play into our our um our discussion of the movie? Who knows? If the movie is too much for us, will we have to turn it off? No, we're not going to do that. I kind of don't doubt that because fucking, it is our job watch to watch the watch the whole movie. Well, I want to thank you guys for having this good discussion about an interesting movie, a little a little history lesson, a little visual history book. If if you'll take Abrams' interpretation, or a nice little gander at the paintings in the Met, if you take mine. Gabe, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm glad you watched this movie, and I'm glad you're you're. He's just barely poking out through his shrouding in darkness. There. Um, I was gonna say that was a this was a poor choice to not leave the light on. Yeah, well, <laughs> here it's very atmospheric. He's like uh, he's like a Marlon Brando in the end of Apocalypse now, fat, drunk, and mostly out of frame um <laughs> on that note he's been think, saving that one he's saving yeah that that's one a good note to end this on uh, thank you remember to hit all those buttons you know like subscribe rate five stars we we really do uh don't make any money off this so but if you enjoyed it please let us know um we i i like making this for the sake of making it it's you know make art not content right fellas no that fell on dead ears like all right to make money good riddance Let's get out of here. Peace. Goodbye. Uh Uh-oh. God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Gabe? All right, so my... This didn't work. He's in the other room. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Who? He's Who at he? Pat's desk. Yeah. Gabe. Oh. He watched the movie with me last night, and he's going to join us for this episode. <laughs> oh. And I was going to have it be like a surprise fucking guest appearance, but he doesn't know how to use Discord, and also, what the fuck is that? Mm-hmm.